Skyrim, the tenth game in the Elder Scrolls series, the fifth main titled Elder Scrolls game, taking place 200 years after Oblivion. Now last time, I asked a simple question, what if Oblivion was good? Today, I'm going to ask that same question, what if Skyrim was good? No, I mean really good. I know saying this immediately implies in people's minds that Skyrim was bad, but I really like Skyrim. But if you're watching this series for the first time, please check out my What If Oblivion Was Good video first. I'll have that video linked in the video description below. Also, keep in mind this is another very subjective piece of fan fiction because it's never going to happen. Now I won't be able to cover every single point and explanation in this video because that would make it several hours long, but we're gonna get to the basics right now. Part one are the mechanics and world building. For part two, we'll get on to the story. Now, first of all, we're gonna triple Skyrim's world size. And yes, a lot of people are gonna tell you that doesn't work in the Skyrim engine, it's too much effort, um, what have you. We're throwing all of those arguments out the window, and we're going to assume they worked harder, worked longer, and they had a better engine. Now, even though we've tripled the world size, we're gonna keep the relative positions fairly well the same. Meaning that, and Whiterun is in the same basic location, it's just further because of the distance between. Allowing there to be more farms, fields, paths, and smaller villages. Now in keeping with earlier Elder Scrolls games, Northern Cyrodiil and Southern Skyrim are both extremely snowy mountainous regions. So that green Falkrith doesn't exist. That brown Whiterun, it might exist in Scandinavia or something, but this isn't Scandinavia, this is Tamriel. So, it's snowy too. Sometimes it's not snowy, but most of the time it is. Now, the more brownish landscape would be closer to the Riften area, and the Reach would be the green area of Skyrim. But the real reason for the expanded landmass is not to add filler content in the middle. It's to make the cities larger without compromising the distance between those cities. And this isn't just nitpicking this time. If you've seen any of my live streams where I revisit Oblivion, you'll see those city-states actually feel like city-states. And if you've seen me play Daggerfall in any of the earlier games, again, those cities feel like cities. But unlike the Counts of Cyrodiil governing more or less their own countries, what we have are Jarls governing a small village. I mean, yes, you can explain it away in the lore, but explaining it away does not make it good, and this is going to be an idealized Elder Scrolls V. So, bear with me. Whiterun was to be the trade hub of Skyrim, not due to its prominence, but rather its location, and it should be the largest city in Skyrim. Let's start at the top of Whiterun and work our way down. The first thing that irked me is they had the nerve to use the word district. A couple of houses and a palace? These aren't districts, they're, they're hardly even town-worthy, let alone city-worthy. So, this map that's on the screen right now uses the original White Run as a model up at the top. And the entire White Run, the size of that, would make up the Cloud District, with other districts being proportionately larger. This creates a main city on par with those seen in earlier Elder Scrolls games. And for those of you who say that's not possible, Go play The Witcher 3 and get lost in the city of Novigrad. Talk to its citizens. Do its side quests. Now, back to Skyrim. The Cloud District should be the current size of Whiterun entirely, holding more than just the Jarl's Palace. It should hold the Battleborn and Grey May Manors, a couple other noble families, and a few other things like the Hall of the Companions. And we're going to talk about those noble families in a later section. We're going to talk about the companions in a later section. Now, the Cloud District not only has a moat around it, but it has gates. And the guards aren't going to open those gates for just anybody. You'll have to have official business for one of the quests, which will give you a pass that will let you into the Cloud District. And that won't even get you into the palace. That'll just get you into the Cloud District. Do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. So, you don't have access to the Cloud District in the beginning, and if you tried to pick the lock, the guards would 
immediately notice and kick your ass. Throw you in prison. But not the Dragon's Reach prison. No, they have a garrison down at the bottom of the city where you'd get thrown in instead. Sorry. So next up is the Wind District underneath it. Let's assume that it's large enough to actually be considered a district. Multiple NPCs have their homes there. There's countless new NPCs that circle around the district. More or less, you could say this district makes up a horseshoe around the Cloud District. And it's just one level down from it. So at the center of the Plains District, we're going to have a park. Not just a little square, but a whole park. Now to one side, we're going to have the Temple of Kinnereth, but we're renaming it to the Temple of Kine. And this is going to be a recurring trend with all of the neutral and Stormcloak controlled areas because they worship the old gods. Now opposing that, on the other side, we're going to have the Temple of the Eight. That is, the Eight Divines. The religion we knew as the ancient Nordic pantheon is now going to be the current Nord religion. And more or less, the civil war is actually a religious war between the Imperial Cult and the Temple of the Old Kingdom. Do you remember the Imperial Cult from Marwind? Yeah, it's back. These will be two joinable factions that are mutually exclusive, but we'll touch on them later. Whiterun is going to be in an extremely awkward position. The traditional Nordic god for Talos is Ysmir. And for the sake of the whole plot, we're going to assume that the ban on Talos also extended to the worship of Ysmir. So the Wind District is actually going to have a lot of pilgrims in it who have fled Imperial controlled areas to the freedom of Whiterun, where the Jarl has basically guaranteed everyone religious freedom. The Temple of Kinnereth, now the Temple of Kine, previously had injured soldiers there. We're replacing that with basically housing for the pilgrims. And we'll still have hurt soldiers and whatnot, but they can all go in the garrison, which will be in the Plains District. Now the current running through Whiterun is that the Jarl's going to be openly giving aid to the Temple of the Old Kingdom and preventing the Imperial Guards from arresting people for openly worshipping Ysmir. While this is going on, the Jarl is preventing violence against members of the Imperial cult who've rejected Talos. In fact, the whole city is just a powder keg waiting to explode in violence, and the Jarl is trying his best to hold it all together. For this reason, the taxes are high, the nobles are unhappy, and the peasants, unable to pay their high taxes, are forced to submit to guard duty. Yes, white run guards are actually pissed off peasants who have no other way to pay their taxes. So we're going to have white run knights, known as the Companions, guarding the Cloud District, and more or less tax-forced conscripted peasants guarding the areas below. This is a very haves and haves not situation, and it shows. Remember if you went up to Jarl Balgruff before you started doing that Bleak Falls Barrow stuff? And he'd say, next time talk to my steward. Next time deal with Avenici. Well, the reason is because Heavy weighs the crown upon the head of the troubled ruler. He's got some real shit to deal with. We're going to cut out all those things about the Jarl heading to the bar and he needs bodyguards, all of that. The Jarl never goes to the bar. He can't afford to. Some irate peasant might kill him. His situation is far too tenuous for that. He might be assassinated by either the Imperial Cult or the Temple of the Old Kingdom. So we're keeping Hemisker, the, the guy who show, shouts, Let me show you the power of Talos Storm Crown! Be in the park between the two temples. If you don't kill him yourself, there will actually be a quest about him when the war is settled, the details of which depend on who won, either venerating him or more or less arresting him. Finally, we have the Plains District. In addition to the aforementioned White Run garrison being there, where all the lowborn guards live, we're going to have all the shops and market stalls befitting the trade capital of the province. Literally, when you enter those gates, you're going to be treated to a great marketplace. And then to one side, you're going to see all the inns and taverns and more or less slums. And then on the other side, you're going to see the craftsmen and the bank and the storage depots and all the places that basically make White Run keep going. You get the sense that this is where all the money comes. There should be at least two competing inns, 
even if one is always full up, say it's the better inn, you would have to settle for the lesser inn. It doesn't matter. Now, uh, either inn you could go to get some radiant quests, and in the slums there'd be tons of people who couldn't pay their taxes and weren't fit for guard duty, so they literally lost their homes. They live in shacks and more or less drink from sewer water. Again, haves and haves not system. Now, when you get out of Whiterun, the areas outside of Whiterun, those broken down ruins, they're going to be built up properly. The Jarl has actually been doing his job and keeping everything mostly intact, so an attack on Whiterun is actually virtually impossible because of the way the ramparts are set up. Uh, a siege would last way too long because he's got defense towers all around the city proper. More or less, Whiterun is the third man in the Civil War trying to be the true neutral party. Not out of indecisiveness, but about freedom. Not the Stormcloak freedom that is Skyrim belongs to the Nords, but rather the a unique freedom to Jarl Balgruff, Skyrim belongs to its people. All its people. Now, similar treatment should be given to the smaller holds that are roughly the size of villages, you know, with basically two or three houses. They're all going to be expanded to vanilla Whiterun size or a little bit larger, knowing that Whiterun is effectively three times larger now than it was in the vanilla game. Every hold's capital will have walls to protect itself from the elements and creatures outside. We established that they did in Elder Scrolls 1 the arena, and once again, people will argue that, oh, well, it's been 200 years, everything's decayed. No, it hasn't. That's just a lazy way of watering down the Nord Kingdom. Now, Winterhold's gonna have a few more buildings under construction, destroyed buildings as far as the eye can see, and peasants working to rebuild their homes. Falkreath should have a large East Empire Company presence, with an Imperial garrison stationed between the Falkreath Gate to the southern provinces. Falkreath is the place where everything from Cyrodiil comes through. It has a strong Imperial presence. And although it's smaller than Whiterun, you can definitely see how it is the Imperial thoroughfare. Now, Riften needs a few more streets and canals, I'd say merely double the size. There should be some sizable slums on the lower level of the city to facilitate the criminal activity. And in proportion to the way the city increased, so too would the Ratway increase in size. As it stands now, town guards could easily waltz into the Ragged Flagon. So instead, we're going to put a labyrinth under there. And you'll have to rely on clues and marks in order to find the Ragged Flagon and not your horrible death. This labyrinth will have a relevancy to the plot later. And 99% of Riften's people don't even know that there's a labyrinth beneath the sewers. Now, in terms of Windhelm, Windhelm will be undergoing the most changes in theme. We're going to take that Nord versus Dark Elf racism and we're going to entirely get rid of it. Simply put, nobody thought that the Stormcloaks were going to rebel because the Empire greatly outnumbered them. But we're going to craft a story where the Counts of the Mead Empire more or less refused to help the Dark Elves because they worshipped Daedra. And there was a huge backlash against Daedra worshippers after the Oblivion Crisis. And that's why the Dark Elves received no help when Red Mountain exploded. So the Empire turned its back on the Dark Elf people. And the Dark Elf people are resentful of the Imperials. And Ulfric Stormcloak saw an opportunity in this. Ulfric Stormcloak opened up the city to the Dark Elves, giving them a place within the Stormcloaks. As one oppressed people to another, the Dark Elves actually have their own district within the city, complete with its own Temple of Reclamations. In fact, we learn that Stormcloak Skyrim is now the main establishment of Dark Elf power since Marwind is now in ashes. The former King of Marwind may rule from Blacklight in Marwind, but he's more or less irrelevant now, a figurehead, because all of the real power is done by this great house, a brand new great house that has risen up out of Skyrim and works hand in hand with the Stormcloaks, serving under Ulfric Stormcloak, who is their undisputed leader. While there'll still be a drunk Nord harassing the local Dark Elf population, you'll get a quest from the Steward of Windhelm 
to more or less put an end to his harassment of their valued allies. Now, as for Solitude, Solitude is the imperial capital of power in Skyrim, and as such, it needs a much larger set of docks with actual sea gates um, protecting this harbor. And the idea is that the Solitude Harbor is going to be where all the Imperial warships are docked. Literally, massive amounts of Imperial troops are exiting the capital down the Nibane River and around Tamriel and up, because we've already established in earlier Elder Scrolls games that going around Tamriel by way of ship is faster than going across the mountainous terrain of northern Cyrodiil into Skyrim. So literally, Solitude is the place where all the Imperial reinforcements are coming from. It needs to be armed to the T. Now as for the city proper, it should have several extra streets. And in amongst it, it will have the Temple of the Eight, which will be the center of the joinable faction, the Imperial Cult. Now we're going to break into factions. In terms of factions, the Companions will not be the Fighters Guild of Skyrim, but rather replacing the Knighthood of Whiterun. The Companions are literally the Jarl's bodyguards and the general muscle of the Cloud District. Codlag Whitemane is literally in the Jarl's court, and he is the first Thane of Whiterun. And the leader of the Companions is always the Thane of Whiterun. When you complete the Companions questline, that is when you're able to become Thane of Whiterun, but not one point before. Unlike the other holds that give away their Thane ships willy-nilly, Whiterun's going to be stingy with it. Now as far as being a werewolf goes, we're going to entirely separate that from the Companions. Werewolves have no place in the mainstream city quests, because they would be hunted and killed. We'll offload that to some kind of hearsing side quest, and or random encounters. Now we're going to create a brand new faction called the School of Junal, which will have a hall in every single city and will act as the Mage's Guild of Skyrim. Now unlike the Temple of the Old Kingdom, the School of Junal doesn't necessarily have a stance on whether or not Ysmir is or is not to be worshipped, so they are actually accepted in Imperial areas as well. Although they do double as a religious order because they do worship Junal, who is Julianos, who is the god of magic. Now, the general staple of the School of Junal is that you would do two Radiant Quests, unlock one Storyline Quest per Hall, and once you've completed that Storyline Quest, you would raise in rank. The ranks would be Associate, Apprentice, Journeyman, Evoker, and Conjurer. Once you are a Conjurer of the School of Junal, you have basically have a recommendation from all the main halls. Once you've done this, you will be able to join the College of Winterhold. You see, the wizard rank of the School of Junal can only be gotten from the College of Winterhold, and you need a referral from the halls to get in. We're going to learn that all the court wizards in Skyrim are actually wizards from the School of Junal who graduated from the College of Winterhold and became full wizards. Now, this prerequisite, Stabil Stentor in Solitude, actually didn't graduate from it. So there's kind of a stink about that, and there'll be a side quest more or less dealing with and exposing Sabeel Stentor for what she truly is. Because she has nothing to do with the College of Winterhold. In any other hold, she would have simply been dismissed. But since Solitude worships the Imperial Cult, the School of Junal is there, but it has no political power whatsoever. So, so the School of Junal is like, hey, she's not a legitimate wizard, and... The Imperials are like, yes, she is. So there's that conflict going on there, and it really drives home the fact that in Nord tradition, all of the wizards come from this particular college and nowhere else. And that the Nords at large do not trust wizards who do not come from that college because they are faithless heathens. They do not heed the wisdom of Junal, who's the god of magic. They don't have his blessing, therefore they are probably up to no good. So for the College of Winterhold itself, which is the seat of power for the School of Junal, what happens in the College stays in the College, meaning that 99% of the Nords don't actually know that Archmage Savos is actually an elf. They all assume that it's a College full of Nords, but when you get in there, you find all the races. 
because it turns out that the college is fairly well accepting of prodigies, geniuses. And they've got all of them. These are some really talented people. They aren't novices. People who are just like, You want to learn how to cast a ward? So no, you will not be learning how to use wards. The college itself should be a mystery, looming over the player the entire time while you're working in the school of Junal, dangling this prize in front of the player. No, you can't enter the college until you're a higher rank to prove your devotion. So the Temple of the Old Kingdom is going to be the main religious order of Skyrim, worshipping the nine gods Shor, Kine, Mara, Debella, Sun, Stun, Ysmir, Junal, and Alduin. There will be an overlap with Junal. It means that if you decide to join the Temple of the Old Kingdom after being a member of the Junal, then you will be seen favorably. And the reverse is true as well. So if you are an upstanding member of the Temple of the Old Kingdom and you were to try to join the School of Junal, they would decide, yeah, you're an associate with us now, no problem. You're in good standing. Now, there will be temples of the Old Kingdom in Whiterun, Windhelm, Dawnstar, Riften, and Winterhold. They are the direct enemies of the Imperial Cult, and membership in the Imperial Cult will disqualify you from the Old Kingdom and vice versa. So let's talk about the Imperial Cult now. Known to Nords as the Imperial Cult, or to the Imperials as the Temple of the Eight Divines, it's the primary religion for Cyrodiil. And it has temples in Whiterun, Solitude, Morthal, Falkreath, and Markarth. Yes, you got it right. There, Whiterun has a temple to both. Anyway, as for worship of Ysmir, also known as Talos, that's outlawed to the Imperials. Being a member of the Old Kingdom, again, disqualifies you from being a member of the Imperial Cult. But being a member of the School of Junal does not, because Junal is... In their minds, Julianos, they're the same god, and you're just worshipping the god of magic. Why not worship the god of magic with us too? Now the temple will have you attack and sabotage the imperial cult, and vice versa. If you gain three ranks within the temple, you'll become well known as a Ysmir worshipper, and the Thalmor will actually attack you on sight. Likewise, if you gain three ranks within the imperial cult, you will be contacted by the Thalmor, kind of if you want to become an operative and join the Thalmor on a limited basis. You know, get paid cash prizes for more or less killing members of the Temple of the Old Kingdom. If you join the Thalmor, then their faction will become open to you, but if for any reason you reject them, then the Thalmor will become hostile to you from then on, just like if you were a member of the Old Kingdom. Now, as for the Dark Brotherhood, most of it, most of it is okay. But I have to set this up properly. Let's flash back to vanilla unmodded Oblivion for a second. In Oblivion, if you break the rules of the Dark Brotherhood, the wrath of Sithis will visit you. And it will take the form of a wraith. And it will try to kill you, okay? Uh, so, uh, remembering that, let's say the Imperials never actually find the Sanctuary. So, after Astrid more or less betrays you, you kill the fake Emperor, and um, you get back to the Sanctuary, Astrid is in a main room addressing everyone, basically saying how you got killed, okay? Um, Astrid is like, what the hell? You know, when you walk in because you're still alive. And then, the wrath of Sithis has come for you, Astrid. And literally, a wraith will materialize just like in Oblivion, but in a scripted sequence, brutally murdering Astrid in front of the player and everybody else. So, somebody needs to explain what just happened. I think Nirzir could probably do that. Either way, with the death of Astrid, isn't the end of the Dark Brotherhood, but rather the midpoint. Because after you kill the Emperor, get the big cash prize, and then you start rebuilding the Black Hand. Because you're the listener, and as the listener, you need the Black Hand in order to have speakers who issue orders on your behalf. We're rebuilding the Dark Brotherhood. That is the whole point. And it never got done. But in this case, we're going to set up one, maybe two more sanctuaries. And more or less, just get, get some speakers recruited. And you'll begin issuing orders for people's deaths. And the idea is when you speak to the Night Mother, you don't have to execute every contract yourself. 
You could either execute the contract yourself, or you could go to one of your speakers and say, this assignment shall be done. And they will go, yes, listener, with a bow, and uh, it'll get done for you. And you'll split the reward with them, but you don't have to do it yourself. So let's move on to the alternate forms. Institutionalizing werewolf and vampire were some of the worst ideas Bethesda's had in some time. By institutionalizing, I mean they basically inducted you into those states very easily by very accessible quests. They put them front and forward, when those should be undesirable states that most people do not want to be. I understand why developers don't want to create content that is hidden, but at the same time, the prestige of Werewolf and Vampire aren't there anymore because of this. So we've removed it from the companions. What's going to happen instead is, much like Morrowind and Daggerfall, you have to get more or less bit by a werewolf, contract a disease, after three days you'll become a werewolf, at which point you will require once every two weeks to feed on somebody, otherwise you'll start getting weaker. Your maximum health will start going down, and the game will be very vocal about the fact that you are kind of starving because you haven't killed people. And so, you have to go kill a humanoid as a werewolf. Now, what's going to happen is, is that because you were killing people as a werewolf, after two months of this, you are assumed to have killed a few people. And that's when the silver hand starts coming for you. Just like in Daggerfall, you get werewolf hunters coming after you on a regular basis now because you are a known monster that feeds on people. Someone somewhere witnessed it, you just didn't see it. Now, Skyrim did something very stupid. It turned all the witches, for the most part, into hag ravens and made them all hostile. That's a really stupid idea, so we're reversing that. And now we're going to have some friendly witches and some hostile ones. If you come across a friendly witch's coven, then what's going to happen is, much like with Daggerfall, you're going to be able to deal with them and actually get a cure for lycanthropy from them, provided you do their quest, of course. Now, as for vampirism, I'm going to get into those details when I talk about Dawnguard, and I'll be doing that in the story section after I finish the Skyrim main quest. Now, the last thing I'm going to be talking about in terms of mechanics and world building are the shouts. We're going to be doing away with word walls as a way of gaining shouts. If you've ever played the game Prey, it was a first-person shooter, you took, you were basically a Native American in space. I know, it sounds kind of silly, but you actually went up to these alien control panels, and if you stared at them long enough, the actual words that those alien symbols meant would come up over it like this. We're going to do a similar thing with the dragon language. And literally, if you just stare at the dragon language long enough, you'll be able to read whatever is written on that word wall. And it's going to have, it's going to be like a lore book almost. You will actually get a skill up when you read the uh, word wall. Now, a skill up to which skill, you ask? Well, the Thum skill, of course. Yes, we're going to be adding a Thum skill with a Thum tree with Thum perks. Because Skyrim is all about you being the Dragonborn, that's what we're going to do. The idea is if you never, ever, ever want to shout at all, you don't need to to pick any Thum perks. But let's just assume right now that you did. When you kill a dragon and absorb its soul, you won't get a dragon soul which is currency to spend. You will instantly learn whatever shout the dragon was using. Meaning that there'd be a dragon for every shout in the game. And killing multiple dragons of that type would begin to unlock augments for that shouts. So the second word, the third word, and then the actual augmentations for that shout that you can swap out. I'll explain that in just a second. For killing story-based dragons, not only would you learn a shout, but it would unlock a cutscene because you're absorbing its knowledge as well as its power. Really quick, see a flash about what happened in the ancient days. You know, we'd be able to actually show over tell in terms of the lore by killing dragons. People would go out of their way to kill dragons so they could see the next lore scene play out. Now, back to the mechanics of the shouts. The game should have a Codex of Dragon Speak, and you can open up a menu to create shouts by mixing and matching words. Each shout created would have a certain Thum skill level, and if you tried to create a shout that required a higher Thum skill level than you had, then it would have a chance to fail 
based on how far above the skills requirement you were. So you could have a level 100 uh, Thum, and you could only have, say, 20 Thum skill, and you could try to use it, it would have a very high chance of failing, but not a 100% chance of failing. Because, again, it would be based on the skill check, and so if you were only, say, two or three points below the Thum you were trying to use, then it would work out pretty much all the time. Just a one or two percent chance to fail. Now, a failed Thum would just, you'd make a really loud shouting noise, everything would shake for a minute, and it would, wouldn't have any effect other than that. The Thum was loud, it hurt everybody's ears, but it didn't really do anything. So with this shout mixing and matching system, where you'd unlock words by killing dragons, killing dragons would become a big deal because you'd seek out all the word walls, all the secret dragon barrows. And yes, we would have dragon dens, actual caves that led to dragon nests and things like that, places where that they hoarded their treasure. More or less what we got was a very, very thin line of what would be possible. And what I'm saying is that we could unlock something far, far better. But that is literally it for game mechanics. In the next episode, I'm going to completely rewrite Skyrim's main quest story, as well as the stories of Dawnguard and Dragonborn. If you like this video, give it a like. If you didn't, go ahead and give it a dislike. I don't mind. But go ahead and please leave a comment. Remember, that takes too much time. Engine limitations. Or you have a, a lore excuse. None of that holds water in this conversation because this is an idealized Elder Scrolls V. And for the rest of it, I will see you all next time.